So I think what we'll do is we'll begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Saint Therese, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Now, I was told that there were 25 of you who were signed up for this retreat. So what I did is that there's a folder, 25 folders here. And basically what I've done is I'm, for each conference, at the end of each conference, uh, I've, I've got a printout of the conference. And so if you want to take it and, and go over it again and look over something that maybe you didn't uh, catch or you want to reflect on, you can do that. For this conference today, uh, basically the first conference I just wanted to talk about the stages of the spiritual life the three different stages because I think it's uh, helpful to kind of have an overview in general of what the spiritual life is like you know we jump into Saint Therese we want to talk about her but it's good to understand in general how the spiritual life works how God has uh, designed our spiritual growth to be and so I, typically if I give a retreat and I haven't given too many but I want to start out with this as kind of the first talk, because then you can kind of see a little bit, again, of the overview, and, and you'll see maybe where you are, and maybe some of the things that you've gone through, and you can say, oh, okay, that makes sense. Now I understand why that happened. Now I understand why I went through that difficulty. Um, uh, much of what I'm going to share is from a little book, which I don't have uh, with me. It's up at the in the chapel. It's a little book by a priest named Father Garigou Lagrange. The name of the book is The Three Ways or the Three Conversions of the Spiritual Life. Um, what I've printed out for you for tonight's conference is the, the it's, a, it's a very little book, by the way, but it actually costs a lot if you want to get it because it's out of print. And so I recommended it to someone, uh, I don't know if it was a year or so ago or a few months ago or... Uh, and I said to her, well, you, you might, uh, I recommend this book because it's very helpful to see. And Father Lagrange basically uses the example of the disciples, uh, the apostles in his book. He says, basically, you can see spiritual growth through the growth of the, of the apostles in the Gospels, how, how they grew spiritually. And it's a very small book. Uh, but the book price now is it was $66 or something, because if you want to get it uh, used at, on Amazon, it was $66. And so I told her, I said, well, you probably don't want to actually get the book. But she said, oh, yeah, I got it, and I paid $66 for it. And I thought, oh, boy, that was... A lot uh, because it's about it's about this thick. I mean, it's very very small. The, what I've printed out for you is the fifth chapter of that book, which does give a, a condensed version of those three stages. So we're going to talk about the three stages, and I'm going to also tie that into another spiritual author, Father Adolf Tanqueray. He wrote on the spiritual life too, so I'm going to tie in some of the things that he said as well. The first thing I thought of in a way of explaining the spiritual life was I figured, you know, if you have three fingers, uh, if you hold up three fingers like this, so you've got one, two, three, you've got the three different fingers, uh, each one of those fingers would represent a different spa stage of the spiritual life. So you've got the beginners, you've got the proficients, and you've got the perfect. Now, if you notice, if you hold up three fingers, in between those fingers, you've got gaps, right? You've got kind of the, the gaps in between each one, unless, unless you're like this, and maybe some people have that. Uh, but uh, you've got gaps in between of them. What do those represent? Those represent what are called the two dark nights uh, of the spiritual life. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the dark night of the spiritual life, the dark night uh, of the senses and the dark night of the soul. Has anyone actually heard of that before? Has anyone heard of those terms? Those come from typically St. John of the Cross. And so if you hold up those fingers again, the first valley would be the dark night of the senses. That's what you go to. You have to go through that in order to get to the second stage, which is the stage uh, of the proficient. It's the, it's the stage of those who are on their way to growing in holiness. In order to get to the third stage, you've got to go through another dark night. It's called the dark night of the soul. And that's when you get to the third stage. Some some spiritual writers will say it's more like this. It's more like you go through the dark night of the senses, and then you get to the 
second stage and the third stage is next to it. And then afterward is the dark night of the soul. That's, those are things that we're not really going to try to wrestle with uh, because we're not, none of us are spiritual. Uh, does anyone have a PhD in spiritual theology? If you do, uh, please help me out uh, during the talk. I'd appreciate it. Uh, that's what Mother Teresa, you know, the dark night of the soul, that's what she would have gone through. Uh, it was said that she went through it for about 50 years, um, last 50 years of her life. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to discuss basically each of those three stages. Uh, we'll spend a little more time on the first two stages and a little less time on the last one. We'll spend a little more time on the first two because those are probably more familiar to us and it's good to see how those work. Uh, it's not a rigid scheme either, the three, one, two, three, and dark night, dark night. It's not that rigid either. Sometimes you can be in the first uh, level, the first stage of spiritual growth, and you can experience some of the things that the people in the last stage experience. Similarly, if you're in the last stage, you can experience some of the difficulties of the dark night of the senses as well. So it's not a rigid scheme, but it is, uh, for the most part, trustworthy. It's, it basically explains the general uh, growth in holiness, the general process of growing in holiness. So how do we move from one stage to the next? If you want to move from this stage to this stage, does anyone have a guess on how do you actually do that? How do I get from one stage to the next? It's good to ask the questions. I, I understand why teachers, in a certain sense, like being teachers, because they ask the questions and they already have the answers. Uh, that's one of the benefits of being a teacher. Does anyone know how you would move from one stage to the next? Any, any, any clue? Any thoughts? Leapfrog. 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 The little way of St. Therese. You could say leapfrogging the little way. Uh, basically cooperating with God's grace. It's as simple as that. It's not necessarily easy, but it's as simple uh, as that. What we're going to do is first talk about the beginner stage, the first stage. Uh, it's what's called the first conversion. The first conversion. It's when we move from a state of sin to a state of grace. So obviously we're in the state of Indiana. It doesn't mean moving from Indiana to uh, Massachusetts. I'm from Massachusetts, so I wouldn't say that that's moving to a state of grace, but it's moving from living in a state of sin, obviously, to moving to being in friendship with God, living in a state of grace, either, either through baptism, something that happens when we receive the gift of baptism, uh, or when we receive the gift of the, the sacrament of confession, when we're in mortal sin and we go to confession, we receive absolution, and we get back into God's friendship, we receive the state of grace. You can also think of it as someone who's had a conversion during their life at a certain point in their life. A famous biblical example would be St. Paul, for example, on the road to Damascus, or even the prodigal son. We can think of that in the Gospel of St. Luke. When he hit rock bottom, that's when he actually came to his senses. That's when he came back to his father's house. One thing that we always want to keep in mind with conversion is that God is always the first one to step towards us. Uh, we tend to think, well, I need to, now I need to actually go and look, search for God. He's always the one who's searching for us. He's the first one to actually make the move. Uh, there's a famous poem, I think you've probably heard of it, Francis Thompson. It's called The Hound of Heaven. Uh, it's a famous 19th century, I believe, English poem poem, basically where the, the poet says, the hound of heaven, I tried to flee the Lord all my life, and uh, I, could, I wasn't able to do so, uh, what Francis Thompson says. The Lord was always pursuing him. What is the, the spiritual profile of someone who's a beginner? What is Spiritually, what do they look like? What does it look like in this first stage? The first stage is also called the purgative way. Have, ever, have any of you heard of those terms, purgative, illuminative, and uh, unitive? You've heard of, some of you have heard of those terms before. The first one is the purgative stage. What does it look like to be in that stage? Well, those who, start that, those who are in that stage are the ones who start to take their spiritual life actually seriously. They're the ones, uh, they generally, in that stage, they generally struggle against serious temptations, but they're often successful in doing it. They struggle, but they're successful. 
they also have a certain desire for perfection. It could be a weak desire, it could be a strong desire, but they have a certain desire for perfection as well. So someone who just wants to keep out of mortal sin and, and doesn't want to really advance any further in the spiritual life, they just want to stay out of trouble, uh, they aren't quite yet there uh, in the sense that we wouldn't necessarily consider them in the first stage of beginners. Um, they're almost like someone who's uh, watching the Boston Marathon uh, on, the sides, on the sidewalk, but they're supposed to be running the Boston Marathon. Uh, that's kind of like someone who is not quite begun the spiritual life in that sense. The first step on the way to spiritual perfection is actually the desire for it, the desire to grow closer to, grow, to God, the desire to grow in holiness. Um, that desire corresponds to actually getting into the race, getting into the race that we're supposed to get into. In general, there are two classes of beginners as well. It's very simply, there are those who are generous and those who are less generous in embracing the spiritual life. Beginners are typically still attached to some deliberate venial sins, deliberate venial sins, but, and also why? Because they're generally still governed more or less by their passions. They're still governed more or less by their feelings, by their passions, by sensuality. It could be pride or anger or vanity or jealousy or uncharitableness in word and deed. So obviously there's a great need still to purify our souls when we have those difficulties. Uh, how do they work on purifying their souls and their hearts in this first stage? Well, basically through two ways, through prayer and through mortification. So prayer and penance, obviously going to confession, obviously uh, renouncing ourself, giving up certain things and fighting against sin and temptation. Now, beginners, as they go forward in the spiritual life, they start to grow in two specific areas. Does anyone have any idea what two areas that they start to grow in? Anyone who knows anything about St. Teresa of Avila maybe uh, can guess at this one. What two areas that they, they tend to grow in? They don't tend to grow taller or shorter. Uh, anyone have any idea? Prayer, okay, prayer. They tend to grow in knowledge of two things. Knowledge of themselves and knowledge of God. Uh, that's where their, their spiritual growth tends to be as far as they become more knowledgeable of themselves and of, their, and of God as well. They, be, they know themselves better, meaning that they begin to recognize their limitations they begin to see their defects. They begin to see, boy, I need, I need to be dependent on the Lord. I need to learn to depend more on the Lord than on myself. Someone who's not very faithful, someone who's not too mature uh, spiritually or even as a person, uh, uh, you know, what do we do? We tend to blame everyone else. We, we shift the blame. We see the wrong in everyone else. Uh, someone who is now growing in holiness, starts to move from uh, blaming others to saying, you know, well, okay, maybe the, I have to work on my defects uh, instead of working on other people. A spiritual beginner, someone who's now making the effort to live how God wants them to live, that begins to see and focus on working on their own faults, on their own sins, on their own defects uh, as well. So, for example, they start to understand what sins they usually commit, and they start to make an effort to try to avoid them. Okay, when I see, when I go to this place, or I'm with this person, it tends to give me uh, problems uh, spiritually, so I need to avoid those things, for example. Uh, and they see that they need to deny themselves more, and also they need to mortify their senses. They need to not so much comfort themselves uh, as far as their senses go. At the same time, they begin to know God and they begin to understand him better as well. Father Lagrange said, this is the way he puts it, he says that they begin to know the Lord especially through the things of nature and also through the things like the parables, like the story of the prodigal son, the story of the lost sheep. People begin, that actually connects for people, uh, especially if they're in the first stages. And I said, pointed out the example this evening of the moon. Uh, you know, what's the moon a symbol of? It's a symbol of Our Lady. 
famously in the church. It's, she, the, the moon reflects the light of the sun, just as Our Lady reflects the light of Christ. And so we see that, we say, wow, that's, isn't that great? So that could be a sign that I'm at least in the first stage. Uh, if I'm seeing the moon and I see Our Lady, well, that, that could be a good sign, spiritually. Usually, when someone is in the first, who's in the first stage has been working uh, with prayer and a life of trying to be faithful to the Lord and trying to grow in knowledge of God and love of the Lord, and they make an effort to pray, they make an effort to frequent the sacraments, they're, ty they're typically rewarded by God. Does anyone know what kind of reward God gives them in the, the first stage? What, what type of reward does someone receive here? Joy, more joy, okay. Specifically, what they say is uh, they will receive what are called sensible consolations. Consolations. I don't know if you've ever prayed or you've ever been in the presence of the Lord and you felt God's presence, you felt close to the Lord. Uh, that is typically a reward from God himself. They can receive those consolations in prayer or in spiritual reading or in meditation or just thinking about the things of the faith, thinking about the Lord. Um, why does God give these sensible consolations? Here we actually begin to see uh, that God really is smart uh, in the sense that he knows what he's doing. Why does he do that? Because typically those who are in the first stage are very attached, as we said, to their sensibilities, to their feelings, to their passions, to their desires. And so God wants to win over that sensibility. And if I do something and I receive consolation and, and joy and a certain peace in doing it, then I really become attracted to that thing or whatever uh, person or activity. God knows that. And so he starts to send consolations to us so that we can become more attached to him and less attached to other things, especially sinful things. But here's the problem. What happens is when we receive, uh, typically when beginners receive sensible consolations, they tend to, uh, at times, to take too much complacency in them. They become too self-satisfied. Uh, they think uh, of the consolation as an end in itself rather than as a means to an end. If you've ever received a Christmas gift or a birthday gift and, uh, and you think this is the greatest thing in the world and you're just very, very happy about this gift and you completely forget about the person who gave it to you, it's almost as if they, they don't even exist in the room. You're just focusing on this new phone or whatever it is that you love. Uh, that's the certain thing with the consolations is at times we can focus more on the gift than on the giver. And since we know that our Lord is jealous, uh, he doesn't uh, want uh, us to do that. He wants us to focus on him. An example I thought of, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever seen the, or read the book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe uh, by C.S. Lewis or seen the movie. I know in the movie and even in the book, Edmund, one of the stars there, he becomes addicted to Turkish delight, right? He, he actually becomes uh, so focused on that that he's willing to give up everything just to... Actually, I think I tasted that once and it was terrible. Uh, <laughs> actually, I was expecting it to be the greatest thing in the world because I read about it in the book and it tasted horrible. Um, that's an example of someone, sometimes if we get too much focused on the consolation rather than on the gift, uh, rather than on the giver of the gift itself. Also, uh, someone who's in the first stage of the spiritual life, what's another trip up that they can have or we can have is that sometimes because we start to uh, really grow in our faith, we can begin to think that we're, we're now masters of the spiritual life. If you have any question or anything I know, uh, I know what's going on. I, I can explain it all. Uh, I thought of it's like if you go to the Mass, uh, you know, here typically when we celebrate Mass. If we sing Mass, we'll sing the, the parts of the Mass. We'll sing the, the Kyrie, the Gloria. Uh, we'll sing uh, the Agnus Dei. If I sing the, the Gloria and the Kyrie, uh, well, the Kyrie is in Greek, uh, but the Gloria and the Agnus Dei is in Latin. So let's say I know that now by heart. So I, it's almost as if someone who knows that by heart thinks that now they can go out and teach uh, Cicero or Roman mythology or ancient Latin, ancient... Uh, it's not quite, uh, you're not quite at that level yet. Sometimes we can think that we're further along than we are. At this point, St. John of the Cross says that what happens, this says the seven capital sins uh, 
make their appearance in the spiritual life. No longer, he says, in their gross form, but now in the order of spiritual things. Now in the order, what does that mean? For example, uh, no longer worldly pride, but now spiritual pride. No longer having an anger problem, but now we're angry because uh, people aren't as religious as we are, or uh, because they're not, they don't see things as spiritually as we do now. It's, the problem there is that the anger hasn't gone away. Uh, the anger is still there. Now it's in a more spiritualized form. It just manifests itself in a different form. So God sees this, and he says, I've got to do something. So what does he do? That's when he brings us to the first valley. The first valley is called the passive purification of the senses. Uh, we have to receive that as beginners because, again, we tend to be too attached to consolations and too imperfect as far as the Christian life goes. So we're called to what's the second conversion. The second conversion is the passive purification of the senses, known as the dark night of the senses. When St. John talks about the senses, he means, uh, he does mean the external senses, so seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling, he does mean those, but also it involves what are called the internal senses as well. And what are the internal senses? Your imagination, your memory, our cognitive senses, our ability to reason as well. A soul has to pass through this night of the senses in order to move from, again, from that first stage, from the, from the beginning stage, in order to get to that second stage, you have to pass through that valley. You have to pass through that spiritual darkness. What is the dark night of the senses? St. John of the Cross says that it consists in a prolonged series of aridities, of dryness, sensible obscurity, produced in an imperfect soul when God begins to infuse the soul with contemplation. That's a lot, isn't it? So it begins uh, with, there's a lot of aridity, there is dryness, there's obscurity. Why? Uh, why do we feel that in prayer or in our spiritual life? Because God is beginning to give us a higher form of prayer, and we're not able to accept it uh, as fully as we should. Again, what are, what are the characteristics uh, of the dark night of the senses? There are three, three characteristics. Uh, if, if you have all three of these going on spiritually at the same time, most likely you're in the dark night of the senses. What are they? One, again, is that prolonged series of aridities. What does that mean? God, you know, the, the sensible consolation, the candy, God takes it away. He takes it away from us. Uh, and problem is, is we've grown greedy for it, and so when, if you've ever taken something away from a baby, uh, that uh, the baby uh, is uh, just focused on and loves so much, uh, what happens, it tends to not be too happy. Uh, and so God takes away the candy from us. Uh, that's the first sign. We have in prayer or in our spiritual life, there's aridity, there's dryness. We don't feel very close to God in prayer. Second sign is that in the midst of of aridity or dryness, actually the, the desire for God remains. It can even be an intense desire for God. That desire for the Lord, that desire to be united to the Lord actually does remain, together with a fear of offending Him and of not serving Him well. So sometimes the person who's in the dark night of the senses thinks that they're not, uh, they're not serving the Lord well. They're not doing what they should be doing. That's why they don't feel close to God. That's why they don't feel his consolation. That's not always the case. The third sign is that you're, that you're in the dark night is that if you have difficulty meditating according to the normal way of doing so, like reflecting and reasoning in prayer, meditation. Some of you maybe do Lexio Divina uh, as well. Instead, you have, instead of that, you, so you have difficulty doing that. You have difficulty meditating or reflecting on, on the Lord or on his words or even on the mysteries of the rosary. If you pray the rosary and you pray the meditations. But instead of doing that, uh, 
you're more inclined towards a different type of prayer, towards a simpler type of prayer, a more simplified type of prayer. It's a prayer known as simple regard with love. It means that you are more inclined to just gaze on the Lord uh, and or simply just be in his presence in a loving way without necessarily thinking or reasoning a lot. You just want to be in his presence. You don't necessarily want to. Typically with meditation, what do you do? You're reading, you're reflecting, you're thinking about what you're reading, you're speaking to the Lord uh, about what you're reading, uh, you're trying to apply what you're reading to yourself. If you're in the dark night, typically that gets tiresome, and you just want to be, uh, just want to be in God's presence. You just want to gaze on the Lord. So they said, if you have all three of those signs present, one, two, three, if all three of them are present in your spiritual life, most likely you're in the dark night of the senses. If there's another difficulty, if you're, you're in that. If you're having difficulty in prayer and uh, let's say we, we're just kind of uh, we've given up on prayer or we've become lazy in the spiritual life well then it's probably more connected with that than it is with God bringing us through the dark night it's probably more that we need to redouble our efforts and get back to praying and spending time with the Lord like we were doing before him what are some of the other difficulties that might accompany this purification of the senses? So those are the three main ones that you have to keep in mind. What are some of the other difficulties that you might have at the same time? Well, there can be temptations. There can be temptations to impatience. There can be temptations against chastity, temptations against faith, hope, charity. There can be discouragement as well. There can be a spirit. You mean, I think it was Father... Tanqueray says there can even be a spirit of blasphemy with some people. They can just be very angry and almost like they, they want to say uh, blasphemous words uh, uh, in a very strong and violent way at times. They can feel that coming through over them. There can also be persecution and ridicule from others. So it's not just always stuff that's happening inside of me. It can be people outside who start treating me the way that they shouldn't be treating me. There can be also sicknesses, if you, misfortunes. Losing your good name, losing friends, losing possessions. Uh, there can be also scruples, perplexities, confused thinking, other afflictions as well. There can be a whole bunch uh, of different types of afflictions. Uh, and all of that can be part of God purifying our hearts. It can be part of the dark night of the senses. Like Father Tanqueray, I like his description. He says that, the dark night of the senses, quote, is a, com a complex state of the soul and a baffling mixture of darkness and light, of aridity and intense, though hidden love for God, of real weakness and latent energy, difficult to analyze without falling into apparent contradictions. Basically, he's saying it's, it's even hard to explain what's going on. It's not even that easy to explain what's happening to you. How long does the dark night last? How long does it last? Does anyone have any idea how long the dark night? Does anyone want to guess? Anyone want to throw out a number? How many days or how many hours or how many years? Or No guesses. Huh? 40 days? That would be great. That would be, you can get that over with. 40 days would be good. A couple years? Can be a couple years. Believe it or not, there's no specific time, as long as God wants, basically. The time is always in his hands regarding that. As long, it can be as short or as long as God wills, and according, also according to our cooperation with his grace, too. Also according to our cooperation. Again, it can last for a long time or a short time. It can be continuous, or there can be moments of rest, or reprieve. You can have a moment where the light comes in and you feel closer to the Lord and things are going great, and then the next day, that's gone again. It depends on how much purification the Lord has to do. It depends on the weakness or the strength of our soul. It depends on the degree of holiness that God has called us to. Uh, God, as we know, proportions his graces to the severity of the trials. So he'll always give us the appropriate grace no matter how difficult the trial is that we're going through.
If the soul is patient, if it cooperates with God, it's what happens during the purification of the dark night? Well, its sensibilities, its feelings, its passions will become more and more subject to the spirit. You know what that means is basically you'll be more and more uh, you'll master of yourself. Rather than my feelings or passions controlling me, I'll be more in control of them. I'll be more in control of them. My, my spirit will be more in control of them. Also, the soul will be cured of its spiritual greed and pride. If you go through a dark night, which is really difficult, pride uh, tends to get uh, chopped down uh, a number of notches. Uh, you tend to realize I need to be more humble. And wherever there's humility, there's our Lord, there's our Lady as well. That's so when people say, you know, I have trouble, Father, being with someone who's, you know, with humiliations. I don't want to ask for help because it's humiliating. And I said, well, you should think of it this way. If it's humiliating, I should say, well, that, that, that's humility. That gives me humility, so God likes that. So I should, my spiritual uh, light, light bulb should go off. Humiliation, humility, that's a good thing. That's typically not the way we think, but uh, I think that's a healthier way to try to look at opportunities to grow in humility. Also, what will happen is if when you go through the dark night and you persevere, you'll have a more profound knowledge of yourself and also of your neediness, your spiritual poverty, your spiritual neediness as well. So what's happening in this period of purification is basically God is tilling the ground of our soul. He's like a good farmer. He gets out all the weeds. He tills the ground. He gets rid of the rocks. That's what he's doing during this, during this, pacif during this pure uh, pacification. He's actually getting rid of all the evil weeds, all the relics of sin that are still in our soul. The danger here is to turn back. It's not automatic. Just because I'm going through this, I'm going to get through it, and everything's going to be fine. Some people turn back. Some people don't want to go through it. And I think a lot of the reason that they turn back is because they don't understand that this is normal in the spiritual life. This is kind of what's supposed to happen. Uh, if you understand that that's, this is part of spiritual growth, then you're more likely to persevere and continue growing. Uh, if you don't, uh, then you're more likely to turn back. Those who pass through this night of the senses successfully find themselves in the second spiritual stage. The second one, which is in the middle one here, it's what's called the, the stage of the proficients or the illuminative stage. Here it says the soul attains a certain stability. There's also growth in freedom. There's growth in love. There's growth in prayer. There's also a deeper purification of the soul as well. The great aim in this second stage, or the, the second, uh, second level of the spiritual life, the great aim is to imitate Christ, to imitate the life, the light, to imitate the virtues of Christ. Jesus, as we know, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says he's also the light of the world. Those who follow me will not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of of life, so we try to imitate the light. We try to imitate Christ. That's why it's called the illuminative way. We're actually trying to reflect more and more the character of Jesus. Those who've entered this way have acquired a purity of heart to a certain degree after having gone through the purification. They've even renounced deliberate venial sin. They don't even, even things that they know are venially sinful. They say, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to embrace those sins. They also have a profound convictions regarding the things of the faith, regarding the truths of the faith. And that helps also in prayer. In their prayer life, they give more time to affections, to petitions to the Lord, uh, to devout affections in prayer. With beginners in the first stage, the biggest problem was the struggle with sin, the struggle against sin, the struggle to fall back. Either I fall back or I go forward. That was kind of the struggle there. Now the struggle is to put on the virtues of Christ, to put on the virtues of our Lord, the virtues of Our Lady as well. 
Our Lord in this stage really becomes uh, to, to be the center of our lives. He moves from being on the periphery to more toward the center. We understand he really does need to be the one who's at the center. The proficient's self-knowledge has become more profound at the same time. Says Father Lagrange, they've developed a quasi-experimental or quasi-experiential knowledge of God. They know God more and more now, says Father Lagrange, through the mysteries of salvation, not just through nature, not just through parables. What does that mean now that they, they focus more on the life of Christ? They focus more on his incarnation, on his passion. You could even say they focused more on the mystery of the Holy Eucharist as well. They focus more on the redemption, not just God in a vague way, or in a, which is still fine and still good, or through nature, that's fine, but more through Christ himself. Here also the soul is able to see more and more the goodness of God. God is good, not just uh, not just a judge, uh, he's also a very good. And in reflecting on the mysteries of Christ, what do they do? They receive more and more light from God, so they, have, they grow in wisdom and knowledge and understanding of the things of God. And there's also, that's also, they say, in proportion to our fidelity with grace and our generosity. So those are two things that always have to accompany the the spiritual growth is one we have to cooperate with god's grace and two we have to try to be generous uh, as well when we cooperate here in the second stage of the spiritual life we begin to see the simplicity and the beauty and the sublimity of god and his mysteries uh, we can say you know typically when if you've ever had a conversion or if you know of people who spiritually aren't too far along. Uh, they tend to have a lot of problems. Why is this? Why that? Uh, why does God allow this? Or uh, why did God make things this way? Or all the questions. And those aren't bad questions. Those are important questions. But now, in the second stage, it's more instead of saying why, you know, I don't understand. It's more of like you become in awe of the greatness of God and of the wonder of God. It's no longer so much a problem, all the things that we don't understand. It's no, so much a, no, no longer so much a problem. Now it's, wow, okay, he's God, I'm not, uh, and I'm glad he is. Uh, St. Paul expresses it in this way. He says in Romans 11, 33, verse 30, verses 36, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches, riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, how unscrutable are are his ways for who has known the mind of the lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever amen it's no longer so much wrestling with the problems of god it's just realizing god is uh he's unbelievable and it's that's what's with Job in the book of Job, when Job is wrestling with why he's afflicted with suffering, you know, God appears to him toward the end of the book, and you know what God does? God asks Job 60 or 64 questions, one after the other. Do you know this? Do you know this? Do you know this? Do you know this? And Job at the end says, I don't. Uh, but at the end, he's actually satisfied. God doesn't actually come to him and tell him something specific. He tells him, Job, you're not God, and I am, and, and uh, things are working out for you. And he's satisfied with that. That's how when we get through the, the first stage, we, we reach more that level of, okay, I can be content with not knowing everything because I know who's in charge. Fortunately, it's not me. Proficients begin to love and ponder over the words of our Lord as well. They begin to focus more on his words, on his teachings, on his examples. Again, Jesus becomes a model for study. Jesus becomes someone who we say, I need to study the life of Christ. I need to study and absorb what he says in order to be transformed. They begin to center their thoughts and affections and actions on Christ. It was said of St. Francis, I think it was St. Bonaventure who said this, he said that uh, 
Christ absorbed Francis, he said. Uh, Christ uh, basically took Francis and absorbed him uh, in the sense they became so full of the life of Jesus. That's what Jesus does in the second, second stage. He begins to absorb the soul. The soul becomes more and more like him. There's a famous French Dominican preacher, La Cordaire, called the greatest orator in the 19th century. He, he once said this, he says, Since I have known Jesus Christ, nothing has seemed to be beautiful enough that I should look upon it with desire. Since I have known Jesus Christ, nothing has seemed to be beautiful enough that I should look upon it with desire. It's beautiful. Another interesting quote of his I, I found, uh, he says, It's not genius nor glory nor love that reflects the greatness of the human soul, it is kindness, it's kindness. I thought it was interesting. But he's basically saying, now the desire really becomes for Christ, uh, now that I know him. In the beginner stage, God wins over our sensibility, our sensitivities, our sensibilities. Now he begins conquering or winning over our intelligence, raising it above the excessive preoccupations and complications of merely human knowledge. He simplifies our knowledge by spiritualizing it. And the further you go along in the spiritual life, the simpler it all becomes. What's a good example of this uh, in the gospel? Mary and Martha, right? Mary uh, is there contemplating, sitting at the feet of our Lord, uh, absorbing everything that our Lord is saying and doing. Martha, it's not that she's doing anything bad, but she's just worrying about everything else. Uh, and our Lord obviously praises Mary for that uh, because Mary has chosen the better part, he says. And I joked uh, once, I said, I wonder if, uh, if Mary was sitting in front of our Lord saying to, to our Lord, could you please protect me from Martha? I know she's getting really <laughs> angry with me right now because I'm not helping. But the, the, the idea is that she actually began to focus more on what was important in life. And they're both saints, by the way, so keep that in mind. Proficients are enlightened more and more by the mysteries of Christ's life, and they work on loving God, imitating Jesus' virtues, like his humility, like his gentleness, his patience as well, and they also become attracted to things like the evangelical counsels of poverty, chastity, obedience, making an effort to keep those in spirit, even if they don't profess them. In a vow, they become more attracted to the things uh, that our Lord said are for more devout souls. How does God reward their generosity? He rewards the soul here by giving a greater abundance of light in prayer and contemplation, and also in the works of the apostolate, by giving, also, uh, giving us an intense desire for his glory, also for the salvation of souls. You know, more intense desire to see others saved and brought to the Lord. Also by giving greater ease in prayer, even reaching what's called the, the prayer of quiet, which is one of the higher levels of prayer according to St. Teresa of Avila, which is when the will is momentarily held captive by the love of God. This period is marked also by a great ease in doing works for God, a great ease in teaching, a great ease in directing, a great ease in organizing things uh, in the church or, or things for spiritual, the spiritual life. Father Tanqueray, the other author, says that there are many classes of souls in the illuminative way, but he specifically mentions two. He says there are basically two types. There are the devout souls and there are the fervent souls. Uh, he says, devout souls are those possessed of goodwill, of ambition to do good, and who strive by serious efforts to avoid deliberate faults. However, he says, they're still vain and presumptuous. Little accustomed to self-denial, they lack energy, steadiness of purpose, especially in the face of trials. Hence, the frequent vacillation in their conduct. They're ready to suffer when trials are far off. I'm actually very good at that. Uh, the trial is far off, and I'm ready, Lord. I'm going to do it, whatever I need to do to, to help you out. And then uh, if I get a little bit of a cold, uh, I just need to be left alone for the whole day. Uh, it's pretty, pretty pathetic. Uh, they lack patience when facing pain and desolation. They're quick to form generous resolves. They carry them out, but imperfectly in practice. So they make a generous resolution to do something, but they kind of not too well carried out. 
especially if unforeseen obstacles arise. Therefore, their advance is slow, and they stand in need of cultivating the virtues of fortitude, of constancy, and of humility. He says that's about devout souls. What do fervent souls look like here? He says fervent souls are more humble and more generous. They're distrustful of self and confident in God, and they're already habitually already habituated to the practice of self-denial, Christian self-denial. They're more energetic and more constant. However, their self-denial is not absolute or universal. They long for perfection, but their virtue has not yet been solidified by trial. If you're ever asking yourself, why am I having so much difficulty with this person? This make, drives me crazy. Uh, typically, it's because God wants you to work on that virtue. That's why he's giving you exercise, uh, being patient, uh, being kind. Uh, we say, well, I'm not very kind or patient, or you know, I've got a difficult uh, husband. I say, well, there you go. There's, there's, your, there's your saint maker. Uh, it's one of those things where God wants us to exercise virtue in order to grow in virtue. We can understand it up here, but the experiential part, that's the, that's the tough one. When consolations and spiritual joy comes for the fervent souls, they welcome them and rest complacently in them. They still don't have the love of the cross. The firm resolutions they take in the morning, they carry out but partially during the day because they lack constancy. So even the fervent souls have their defects. They have so far advanced in the love of God that they actually renounce what's dangerous, but they bestow their affections at times too much upon what God allows them to love. He says, like their parents, their friends, consolations they find in religious exercises. They still have to detach themselves more perfectly from whatever hinders their union with God. So sometimes we can love even to certain people or things to an excess, is what he's saying. Uh, and we'll mention that, I think, in one of the homilies tomorrow or Sunday. So just like in the beginner's stage, there are generous souls, and there are souls which aren't as generous in the second stage, so too in the proficient stage, uh, it's the same, very similar. So what happens uh, at this stage? So we're, we're in the second stage, and we've got to get to the third stage, and the Lord really wants us in the third stage, so what, what happens uh, at that point? Something very similar that happened when we were in the first stage. Something very similar, when we had been rewarded with sensible consolation uh, in the first stage, what happens in the second stage? Well, the person in the second stage begins to take complacent, complacency, means to be self-satisfied. They become self-satisfied in their ease for prayer and their ease for doing works for the apostolate or teaching or preaching or whatever. It's true that they are working for God, they are working for souls, but they haven't yet sufficiently forgotten one important thing. They haven't yet sufficiently forgotten themselves. Yes, exactly. An unconscious self-seeking and self-importance causes the proficient to dissipate himself and to lose the sense of the presence of God. He thinks that his labors are being very fruitful. It's not quite certain that that's the case, though. He beco he's becoming too sure of himself. He gives himself too much importance and is perhaps inclined to exaggerate his own talents, to forget his own imperfections, and to be too greatly aware of the imperfections of others. All the his comments here that you can throw hers in there as well, too. So this is uh, gender inclusive. Uh, we're, we're all, we're all in, tied in here. He often lacks purity of intention, a spirit of recollection, and perfect straightforwardness. The depth of the soul still doesn't belong entirely to God, and even in the search for God, it's often the self which is really being sought. So there's a need for a third purgation. Without the third conversion, as Father Lagrange says it, there's no way to enter the third stage, which is called the life of union. So this is now what we talk about. This is the dark night of the spirit. This is the other valley. So we went through the dark night of the soul. We came out of that. We're in the stage of the, the, the illuminative stage. Now we're in the dark night of uh, the spirit. Now we're in the dark night of the soul, which is the, the other stage. What does it consist? It, it consists in this, in the soul being deprived of a lot of things. It consists of the soul being deprived of a lot. 
deprived not only of sensible consolations, but also deprived of the supernatural lights on the mysteries of salvation, the things that we learned and that were wonderful. We actually, God takes them away. Uh, deprived also of ardent desires. Deprived of the facility in action and preaching and teaching. This is a period of extreme aridity, not only in regards to the senses, but also the spirit and also in prayer. So it's an aridity and a, and a, a difficulty that's much more interior than just the, the dark night of the senses. Temptations frequently occur during this stage, especially against the virtues that reside in the higher part of the soul. He's talking about the virtues of faith, hope, and charity. Charity towards one's neighbor, even charity towards God as well. Generally during this period, great difficulties occur with things like the apostolate. And in the apostolate, if you're doing work for the Lord, you'll start to get, uh, there'll be detraction, there'll be murmuring, there'll be failures, even you'll do something really well or try to do something well and it'll just fail completely. Hence this crisis or passive purification of the spirit is like a mystical death says Father Lagrange. It's like the death of the old man that St. Paul talks about. Tanqueray says that in order to purify and reform the soul, God, quote, leaves the mind in darkness. He leaves the will in aridity, the memory in forgetfulness, and the affections immersed in pain and anguish. Wow. It's a lot, right? So if you hear of anyone going through, I recently I'd started reading, I always do this, I start reading the Divine Mercy Diary, and I never get that far. I, I think maybe four or five times I've read, you know, the first part, and I did really well, and then I just after a little while, I just turned to another book. Right in the beginning of her book, she's in the dark night of the soul. I mean, if you know anything about the spiritual life, this is when she's a novitiate. Basically, when she's just starting religious life, she's already in the dark night of the soul. She's already going through... Uh, these things. Um, maybe that's why I didn't I stop reading it. It was kind of scary. Uh, right in the beginning, she's already there. Um, Could you repeat that? The will in aridity, the memory in forgetfulness, and the affections immersed in pain and anguish. In order to sustain the soul in this trial, God sends intervals of relief during which it experiences a sweet peace and the enjoyment of divine love and familiarity comes to mind uh, right now in the, gar in the Garden of Gethsemane when the angel was sent to our Lord uh, during his agony. An angel was sent to give relief to our Lord during his agony. It's kind of like the relief that can come in the dark night of the soul. But such moments are followed by counterattacks when the soul imagines itself to be no longer loved by God and to be justly forsaken by him. In this state, prayer is quite impossible. Or if one does pray, it's amidst such aridity that it seems that God really isn't listening. For some people during this purification, they, can even, they can't even complete their basic duties or activities well. Some people, uh, even in their daily lives, they're not able to function. Well, their memory for the things that they normally do is almost gone completely. It's purgatory and a sort of hell all rolled into one. Uh, it's, all, it's both of them rolled into one. The trials of this period are permitted by God in order to lead proficients to a more lofty faith, to a firmer hope, and to a pure love, because it's absolutely necessary that the depth of their soul should belong completely to God. As we said, God is very jealous of us. He doesn't want any part of us to belong to something uh, that's not him. This is the meaning of the words of Scripture, wisdom, chapter 3, verse 6. As gold in the furnace, he hath proved them, and as a victim of the Holocaust, he hath received them. So it's a purification that God gives. Tanqueray, inciting John of the Cross, says that the reason for the night of the Spirit 
is for the soul to be freed from habitual and actual imperfections. So God wants to get rid of all the imperfections that we have in us. He's trying to free us through that, through this purification. The habitual imperfections refer to imperfect affections and habits embedded in us, which the purification of the senses couldn't reach. So the first purification didn't get everything. So this is going to get the second. This is going to, this is going to get the rest. And also being too easily distracted and easily drawn to attractions outside of us. I think he's referring here mainly to prayer as well. The actual, imperfe- the actual imperfections refer to pride and self-complacency from which, from spiritual consolations received. So getting rid of pride, getting rid of self-satisfaction. This crisis, like the crisis of the night of the senses, is not without its dangers. Of course, people can turn back. Uh, they can and do. It calls for great courage and vigilance for a faith, sometimes reaching heroism, a hope against all hope, a hope which transforms itself into perfect abandonment. If you've ever seen that book, uh, Abandonment to Divine Providence by Father Kassad, De Kassad, I think it is. It's very beautiful. Uh, one of the most beautiful spiritual books you ever you could ever read. For the third time, God tills the ground of the soil, but this time he tills much more deeply, so deeply indeed that the soul seems overwhelmed by these afflictions of the spirit. So that's pretty heavy, right? That's pretty heavy. St. Therese, we'll go, we'll go through her tomorrow. She's a little lighter, so she'll, she'll, help us, uh, she'll help us to get there. She actually, it sounds a lot better when she says it, too. These are, these, this is John of the Cross. This is a, this is a German priest and uh, one who's uh, French uh, from the 1930s speaking, so this is going to be hard stuff. St. Therese is, is, is sweeter, uh, but she's still very, very tough. We get to the third stage, which we have one page on, or a little bit more than one page on, the stage of the perfect, the last stage of the spiritual growth. It's characterized by an habitual and intimate union with God through Jesus Christ. The spiritual life here is simplified and brought to unity, converging on that intimate union with God through the virtue of charity, through charity. Tanqueray lists some of the characteristics of this stage. He says, these are some of the characteristics of people who are in the third stage of the spiritual life. This is, I'm actually reminding of myself here. Uh, This is why I I brought up the the image here. I actually, something came to mind uh, when I was thinking about this. Uh, The third stage, going from the second to the third stage. Uh, This is an image, I don't know if any of you who know anything about painting, When I was in college, I actually studied the history of art. It was one of the classes that I liked the most. It was really interesting. This is a painting by uh, Andrea del Verrocchio. Uh, Verrocchio. He was a Renaissance painter. He lived in Florence at the time of the Renaissance, the 15th century. Uh, This is a painting of, can you tell what this is a painting of? The Baptism of Christ, right? That's the the title of the painting. This actually, this painting isn't just by him. Uh, This painting has another artist as well who's attached to this painting. I'll be very impressed. Does anyone have any idea who the other artist would be? uh, This is probably the most famous uh, artist. Does anyone have any idea who the other artist would be? No clues. Someone said it, right? Leonardo da Vinci, actually. Uh, he is attributed, it's attributed to Leonardo da Vinci because Verrocchio, what he did was, you know, if you were a painter and you had a studio, you had apprentices. So you painted something, it's given your, your, your they say, well, you're, it's a Verrocchio painting. But really, he does the basic outline and he has every, all of his apprentices kind of fill in and do the rest. So that's how you can do a lot of production back then. Uh, one of his apprentices was, Le- was Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo da Vinci, if you could guess between these two angels, which do you think Leonardo da Vinci painted, if you had to guess between one or the other? Can you have any clue? The one, the one on my left, or your left, uh, is the one that he painted. Uh, the one with more curly hair, the face is even more angelic in the sense that the the cheeks are rosy, and uh, the eyes are very angelic, and the face is very idealized. 
Uh, the other angel isn't quite uh, as beautiful. <laughs> okay, and some of you, it's good that you notice this because uh, that, that shows that you can kind of see that. Uh, it's clear, and this is, this is how artists have figured out, okay, Leonardo da Vinci helped paint this, this angel because there's a, there's a big difference between the one on your right and the one on your left. Uh, the one on the left, if you look at other paintings of Leonardo da Vinci, a lot of his figures are like that. They're very idealized, very ethereal, very beautiful. The other angel's not ugly, uh, but you can just tell uh, he's not focused. Uh, he can, he's not even looking with the same glance uh, as Leonardo's angel is. He's basically distracted. Looking, Christ is being baptized, and he's looking off, uh, off at the birds uh, flying around him. I thought of this because this kind of made me think of the difference between someone who's in the, the, the second stage and the third stage, the spiritual life. The second stage, you know, you're living a very good life. You're living a devout life. You're living uh, a life which the Lord is really very, very much uh, at the center. But uh, the third stage looks a lot different. Uh, it looked more like an angel from Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, there's a difference, and you can even see this, I'm sure, and people who you have contact with. There are just some people who you can tell, boy, they're really close to God. I mean, uh, don't, there's no question uh, about it, uh, whether or not God speaks to them directly or not, but you can just tell. They are more moved by the Holy Spirit. They live by the movings of the Holy Spirit more than I do. Uh, so I'm the distracted angel. <laughs> And uh, the, one of the blessings of being a priest is that you do get to see uh, Leonardo angels sometimes, and uh, they're very good because they're very humbling. Uh, that's one of, their, one of their, the graces of being around sanctified souls. So this kind of made me think of the passage that the second stage and the third stage, you become more of a purified soul in this stage. Tanqueray lists some of their characteristics. He says, one, the soul lives continually in the presence of God, and it delights in, to contemplate him living in their heart. Two, the soul's detached from creatures so as to be held by no outward affection. So it doesn't mean he doesn't love anyone, the soul doesn't love anyone, but uh, it's always in the measure that God, they're subordinate always to God. Three, the love of God becomes not only the principal virtue of the soul, but we can say it's also, in a certain sense, it's the only virtue of the soul, um, since all other virtues and all that, that we practice are nothing more uh, than acts of love. So the charity becomes uh, the virtue. Fourth, prayer is more and more simplified until it becomes a very, very often a loving, just a loving, loving, lingering thought of God. In a certain sense, life itself becomes a perpetual prayer because no matter what our activity is, we're constantly glancing at God. We're constantly conforming our wills to his wills. Jesus says in John 8, 29, I always do the things that please the Heavenly Father. I always do the things that please my Heavenly Father. That's someone who's in the third level of perfection. What is the spiritual state of the perfect after the dark night of the Spirit, which has been like a third conversion for them? Well, they know God with a knowledge which is quasi-experimental and almost continuous. They also have a constant sense of God's presence, as we've already mentioned. Whereas at, at the beginning, they had been more selfish, thinking constantly about themselves, uh, either consciously or unconsciously, directing all their, their things to themselves. The perfect soul now thinks constantly of the Lord, thinks constantly of his glory, of the salvation of souls, and so uh, almost a, as instinctively causes all things to converge upon that end. All things finish in God. The reason for that is that, they, that the soul no longer contemplates God merely in the mirror of things of the sense, no longer merely in parables, no longer merely in the mirror of the mysteries of the life of Christ, for this cannot continue throughout the whole day, says Father Lagrange. But now the soul contemplates the divine goodness in itself, very much in the way in which we constantly see light diffused around us and illuminating all things from on high. It's almost like we always have, a, you know, here we have, obviously, the light of the night. But during the day, the light is always uh, around us, and we see everything through the light, uh, even though we can't look directly at the sun. 
the sun is what gives everything light. It's now, now in this stage, we see everything uh, in the light of God. Everything it receives its light from God. This simple contemplation removes those imperfections that arise from impetuosity, from unconscious self-seeking, and from the lack of habitual recollection. The perfect, meaning the perfect soul, knows themselves no longer merely in themselves, but now they know themselves in God. So it's not now I just know who I am, I know my defects and my limits and my, my good qualities even, but now I know everything in God. Their source and their end. They examine themselves, wondering what is written of their existence in the book of life. They never cease to see the infinite distance that separates them from their creator, hence their humility. This quasi-experimental contemplation of God comes from the gift of wisdom, and by reason of its simplicity, it can be almost continuous, almost continuous connection with God. It can persist in the midst of intellectual work, conversation, external occupations as well. So you're completely absorbed in the things of God and God himself. Finally, whereas the egoist, thinking always of himself, wrongly loves himself in all things, the perfect, thinking nearly always of God, loves him constantly and loves him not merely by avoiding sin and by imitating the virtues of our Lord, but now by adhering to him, enjoying him, desiring, as St. Paul said, to be dissolved and to be with Christ, said the Apostle. It is the pure love of God and the love of souls in God. It is apostolic zeal, zealous beyond measure, but humble, patient, and gentle at the same time. This is the love of God, no longer merely with the whole heart, with the whole soul, with the whole strength, but continuing up the scale now with our whole mind as well. That's what Jesus said. That's what the Old Testament, the first commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. The great model for such souls after the holy soul of our Lord is the Blessed Virgin Mary. She is the great model and teacher. And that concludes, I knew it was a long one, so this is the longest one. That concludes uh, this introduction into the, what the spiritual life is all about. If it seems like it's too much, if it seems overwhelming, well, we'll St. Therese will help us. St. Therese will help us. Don't worry about that. So why don't we finish with a prayer? Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.